The Queen's Twin, a story by Sarah Jewett. One, the coast of Maine was in former years brought so near to foreign shores by its busy fleet of ships that among the older men and women one still finds a surprising proportion of travelers. Each seaward stretching headland with its high set houses, each island of a single farm has sent its spies to view many a land of Eshkol. One may see plain contented old faces at the windows whose eyes have looked at faraway ports and known the splendors of the Eastern world. They shame the easy voyager of the North Atlantic and the Mediterranean. They have rounded the Cape of Good Hope and braved the angry seas of Cape Horn in small wooden ships. They have brought up their hardy boys and girls on narrow decks. They were among the last of the Northmen's children to go adventuring to unknown shores. More than this one cannot give to a young state for its enlightenment. The sea captains and the captains' wives of Maine knew something of the wide world and never mistook their native parishes for the whole instead of a part thereof. They knew not only Thomaston and Castine and Portland, but London and Bristol and Bordeaux and the strange-mannered harbors of the China Sea. One September day, when I was nearly at the end of a summer spent in a village called Dunnet Landing on the Maine coast, my friend Mrs. Todd, in whose house I lived, came home from a long, solitary stroll in the wild pastures, with an eager look, as if she were just starting on a hopeful quest instead of returning. She brought a little basket with blackberries enough for supper, and held it towards me so that I could see that there were also some late and surprising raspberries sprinkled on top, but she made no comment upon her wayfaring. I could tell plainly that she had something very important to say. "'You haven't brought home a leaf of anything.' I ventured to this practiced herb gatherer. You were saying yesterday that the witch hazel might be in bloom. I dare say, dear, she answered in a lofty manner. I ain't going to say it wasn't. I ain't much concerned either way about the facts of witch hazel. Truth is, I've been off visiting. There's an old Indian footpath leading over towards the back shore through the great heron swamp that anybody can't travel over all summer. You have to seize your time some day just now while the low ground is summer dried as it is today and before the fall rain set in. I never thought of it till I was out of sight of home, and I says to myself, Today's the day certain, and stepped along smart as I could. Yes, I've been visiting. I did get into one spot that was wet underfoot before I noticed. You wait till I get me a pair of dry woolen stockings in case of cold, and I'll come and tell you. Mrs. Todd disappeared. I could see that something had deeply interested her. She might have fallen in with either the sea serpent or the lost tribes of Israel, such was her air of mystery and satisfaction. She had been away since just before mid-morning, and as I sat waiting by my window, I saw the last red glow of autumn sunshine flare along the gray rocks of the shore and leave them cold again, and touch the far sails of some coastwise schooners so that they stood like golden houses on the sea. I was left to wonder longer than I liked. Mrs. Todd was making an evening fire and putting things in train for supper. Presently she returned, still looking warm and cheerful after her long walk. Now, there's a beautiful view from a hill over where I've been, she told me. Yes, there's a beautiful prospect of land and sea. You wouldn't discern the hill from any distance, but tis the pretty situation of it that counts. I sat there a long spell, and I did wish for you. No. I didn't know a word about going when I set out this morning, as if I had openly reproached her. I only felt one of them traveling fits coming on, and I catched up my little basket. I didn't know but I might turn and come back time for dinner. I thought it wise to set out your luncheon for you in case I didn't. Hope you had all you wanted. Yes. I hope you had enough. Oh, yes, indeed, said I. My landlady was always peculiarly bountiful in her supplies when she left me to fare for myself as if she made a sort of peace offering or affectionate apology. You know that hill with the old house right on top, over beyond the heron swamp? You'll excuse me for explaining, Mrs. Todd began. But you ain't so apt to strike inland as you be to go right along shore. You know that hill. There's a path leading right over to it that you have to look sharp to find nowadays. It belonged to the upcountry Indians when they had to make a carry to the landing here to get to the out islands. I've heard the old folks say that there used to be a place across a ledge where they'd worn a deep track with their moccasin feet, but I never could find it. Tea is so overgrown in some places that you keep losing the path in the bushes and finding it as you can, but it runs pretty straight considering the lay of the land. 
and I keep my eye on the sun and the moss that grows one side of the tree trunks. Some brook's been choked up and the swamp's bigger than it used to be. Yes, I did get in deep enough one place. I showed the solicitude that I felt. Mrs. Todd was no longer young, and in spite of her strong, great frame and spirited behavior, I knew that certain ills were apt to seize upon her and would end some day by leaving her lame and ailing. Don't you go to worrying about me, she insisted. Set and still's the only way the evil one'll ever get the upper hand of me. Keep me moving enough, and I'm twenty-year-old summer and winter both. I don't know why it is, but I've never happened to mention the one I've been to see. I don't know why I never happened to speak the name of Abby Martin, for I often give her a thought, but tis a dreadful out-of-the-way place where she lives, and I haven't seen her myself for three or four years. She's a real good, interesting woman, and we're well acquainted. She's nigher mother's age than mine, but she's very young-feeling. She made me a nice cup of tea, and I don't know, but I should have stopped all night if I could have got word to you not to worry. Then there was a serious silence before Mrs. Todd spoke again to make a formal announcement. She is the Queen's twin. And Mrs. Todd looked steadily to see how I might bear the great surprise. The Queen's twin? I repeated. Yes, she's come to feel a real interest in the Queen, and anybody can see how natural tis. They were born the very same day, and you would be astonished to see what a number of other things have corresponded. She was speaking of some of the facts to me today, and you'd think she'd never done nothing but read history. I see how earnest she was about it as I never did before. I've often and often heard her allude to the facts, but now she's got to be old and the hurry's over with her work. She's come to live a good deal in her thoughts, as folks often do. And I tell you, tis a sight of company for her. If you want to hear about Queen Victoria, why, Miss Abby Martin'll tell you everything, and the prospect from that hill I spoke of is as beautiful as anything in this world. Tis worthwhile you're going over to see her just for that. When can you go again? I demanded eagerly. I should say tomorrow, answered Mrs. Todd. Yes, I should say tomorrow, but I expect it would be better to take one day to rest in between. I considered that question as I was coming home, but I hurried so that there wa not much time to think. It's a dreadful long way to go with a horse. You have to go most as far as the old Bowden place and turn off to the left, a master-long rough road, and then you have to turn right round as soon as you get there if you mean to get home before nine o'clock at night. But to strike across country from here, there's plenty of time in the shortest day, and you can have a good hour or two's visit beside. Taint but a very few miles, and it's pretty all the way along. There used to be a few good families over there, but they've died and scattered, so now she's far from neighbors. There, she really cried. She was so glad to see anybody coming. You'll be amused to hear her talk about the Queen, but I thought twice or three times as I sat there, it was about all the company she'd got. Could we go day after tomorrow? I asked eagerly. To would suit me exactly, said Mrs. Todd. Two, one can never be so certain of good New England weather as in the days when a long easterly storm has blown away the warm late summer mists and cooled the air so that however bright the sunshine is by day, the nights come nearer and nearer to frostiness. There was a cold freshness in the morning air when Mrs. Todd and I locked the house door behind us. We took the key of the fields into our own hands that day and put out across country as one puts out to sea. When we reached the top of the ridge behind the town, it seemed as if we had anxiously passed the harbor bar and were comfortably in open sea at last. There now, proclaimed Mrs. Todd, taking a long breath. Now I do feel safe. It's just the weather that's liable to bring somebody to spend the day. I've had a feeling of Miss Elder Kaplan from North Point being close upon me ever since I waked up this morning, and I didn't want to be hampered with our present plans. She's a great hand to visit. She'll be spending the day somewhere from now till Thanksgiving, but there's plenty of places at the landing where she goes, and if I ain't there, she'll just select another. I thought Mother might be in, too. Tis so pleasant. But I run up the road to look off this morning before you was awake, and there was no sign of the boat. If they hadn't started by that time, they wouldn't start, just as the tide is now. Besides, I see a lot of mackerel men heading Green Island Way, and they'll detain William. No, we're safe now, and if Mother should be coming in tomorrow, we'll have all this to tell her. She and Miss Abby Martin's very old friends.
We were walking down the long pasture slopes towards the dark woods and thickets of the low ground. They stretched away northward like an unbroken wilderness. The early mists still dulled much of the color and made the uplands beyond look like a very far-off country. It ain't so far as it looks from here, said my companion reassuringly. But we've got no time to spare either. And she hurried on, leading the way with a fine sort of spirit in her step. And presently we struck into the old Indian footpath, which could be plainly seen across the long, unplowed turf of the pastures, and followed it among the thick, low-growing spruces. There the ground was smooth and brown underfoot, and the thin stem trees held a dark and shadowy roof overhead. We walked a long way without speaking. Sometimes we had to push aside the branches, and sometimes we walked in a broad aisle where the trees were larger. It was a solitary wood, birdless and beastless. There was not even a rabbit to be seen or a crow high in air to break the silence. I don't believe the queen ever saw such a lonesome trail as this, said Mrs. Todd as if she followed the thoughts that were in my mind. Our visit to Mrs. Abby Martin seemed in some strange way to concern the high affairs of royalty. I had just been thinking of English landscapes and of the solemn hills of Scotland with their lonely cottages and stone-walled sheepfolds and the wandering flocks on high, cloudy pastures. I had often been struck by the quick interest and familiar allusion to certain members of the royal house which one found in distant neighborhoods of New England, whether some old instincts of personal loyalty have survived all changes of time and national vicissitudes, or whether it is only that the Queen's own character and disposition have won friends for her so far away, it is impossible to tell. But to hear of a twin sister was the most surprising proof of intimacy of all, and I must confess that there was something remarkably exciting to the imagination in my morning walk. To think of being presented at court in the usual way was for the moment quite commonplace. 3. Mrs. Todd was swinging her basket to and fro like a schoolgirl as she walked, and at this moment it slipped from her hand and rolled lightly along the ground as if there were nothing in it. I picked it up and gave it to her, whereupon she lifted the cover and looked in with anxiety. "'Tis only a few little things, but I don't want to lose them," she explained humbly. "'To was lucky you took the other basket if I was going to roll it round. "'Ms. Abby Martin complained of lacking some pretty pink silk "'to finish one of her little frames, and I thought I'd carry her some, "'and I had a bunch of gold thread that had been in a box of mine this twenty year. "'I never was one to do much fancy work, "'but we're all liable to be swept away by fashion. "'And then there's a small packet of very choice herbs "'that I gave a good deal of attention to. "'They'll smarten her up and give her the best of appetites come spring.' She was telling me that spring weather is very wilting and trying to her, and she was beginning to dread it already. Mother's just the same way. If I could prevail on mother to take some of these remedies in good season, t'would make a world of difference, but she gets all downhill before I have a chance to hear of it, and then William comes in to tell me, sighing and bewailing, how feeble mother is. Why can't you remember about them good herbs that I never let her be without? I say to him, he does provoke me so, and then off he goes, sulky enough down to his boat. Next thing I know, she comes in to go to meetin', wanting to speak to everybody and feeling like a girl. Miss Martin's case is very much the same, but she's nobody to watch her. William's kind of slow-molded, but there, any William's better than none when you get to be Miss Martin's age. Hadn't she any children? I asked. Quite a number, replied Mrs. Todd grandly but some are gone and the rest are married and settled. She never was a great hand to go about visiting. I don't know, but Miss Martin might be called a little peculiar. Even her own folks has to make company of her. She never slips in and lives right along with the rest as if t'was at home, even in her own children's houses. I heard one of her son's wives say once she'd much rather have the queen to spend the day if she could choose between the two. But I never thought Abby was so difficult as that. I used to love to have her come. She may have been sort of ceremonious, but very pleasant and sprightly if you had sense enough to treat her her own way. I always think she'd know just how to live with great folks and feel easier, long of them in their ways. Her son's wife is a great driver with farm work, boards a great table full of men in hay and time, and feels right in her element. I don't say, but she's a good woman and smart, but sort of rough, 
anybody that's gentle-mannered and precise like Miss Martin would be a sort of restraint. There's all sorts of folks in the country, same as there is in the city, concluded Mrs. Todd gravely, and I as gravely agreed. The thick woods were behind us now, and the sun was shining clear overhead. The morning mists were gone, and a faint blue haze softened the distance. As we climbed the hill where we were to see the view, it seemed like a summer day. There was an old house on the height, facing southward, a mere forsaken shell of an old house with empty windows that looked like blind eyes. The frost-bitten grass grew close about it like brown fur, and there was a single crooked bough of lilac holding its green leaves close by the door. We'll just have a good piece of bread and butter now, said the commander of the expedition, and then we'll hang up the basket on some peg inside the house out of the way of the sheep and have a handsome entertainment as we're coming back. She'll be all through her little dinner when we get there, Miss Martin will, but she'll want to make us some tea, and we must have our visit and be starting back pretty soon after two. I don't want to cross all that low ground again after it's begun to grow chilly, and it looks to me as if the clouds might begin to gather late in the afternoon. Before us lay a splendid world of sea and shore. The autumn colors already brightened the landscape, and here and there at the edge of a dark tract of pointed firs stood a row of bright swamp maples like scarlet flowers, the blue sea and the great tide inlets were untroubled by the lightest winds. Poor land, this is, sighed Mrs. Todd as we sat down to rest on the worn doorstep. I've known three good hard-working families that come here full of hope and pride and tried to make something of this farm, but it beat them all. There's one small field that's excellent for potatoes if you let half of it rest every year, but the land's always hungry. Now you see them little peaked-topped spruces and fir balsams coming up over the hill all green and hardy? They've got it all their own way. Seems sometimes as if wild nature got jealous over a certain spot and wanted to do just as she'd a mind to. You will see here. She'll do her own plowing and harrowing with frost and wet and plant just what she wants and wait for her own crops. Man can't do nothing with it, try as he may. I tell you those little trees means business. I looked down the slope and felt as if we ourselves were likely to be surrounded and overcome if we lingered too long. There was a vigor of growth, a persistence and savagery about the sturdy little trees that put weak human nature at complete defiance. One felt a sudden pity for the men and women who had been worsted after a long fight in that lonely place. One felt a sudden fear of the unconquerable, immediate forces of nature as in the irresistible moment of a thunderstorm. I can recollect the time when folks were shy of these woods we just come through, said Mrs. Todd seriously. The men folks themselves never adventure into them alone. If their cattle got strayed, they'd collect whoever they could get and start off altogether. They said a person was liable to get bewildered in there alone, and in old times folks had been lost. I expect there was considerable fear left over from the old Indian times and the poor days of witchcraft. Anyway, I've seen bold men act kind of timid. Some women of the Asa Bowden family went out one afternoon burying when I was a girl and got lost and was out all night. They found a middle of the morning next day, not half a mile from home, scared most to death and saying they'd heard wolves and other beasts sufficient for a caravan. Poor creatures. They'd strayed at last into a kind of low place amongst some alders, and one of them was so overset she never got over it and went off in a sort of slow decline. T'was like them victims that drowns in a foot of water, but their minds did suffer dreadful. Some folks is born afraid of the woods and all wild places, but I must say, they've always been like home to me. I glanced at the resolute, confident face of my companion. Life was very strong in her, as if some force of nature were personified in this simple-hearted woman and gave her cousinship to the ancient deities. She might have walked the primeval fields of Sicily. Her strong gingham skirts might at that very moment bend the slender stalks of asphodel and be fragrant with trodden thyme, instead of the brown wind-brushed grass of New England and frost-bitten goldenrod. She was a great soul, was Mrs. Todd, and I her humble follower, as we went our way to visit the Queen's twin, leaving the bright view of the sea behind us and descending to a lower countryside through the dry pastures and fields. The farms all wore a look of gathering age, though the settlement was, after all, so young. The fences were already fragile, and it seemed as if the first impulse of agriculture had soon spent itself without hope of renewal.
The better houses were always those that had some hold upon the riches of the sea. A house that could not harbor a fishing boat in some neighboring inlet was far from being sure of everyday comforts. The land alone was not enough to live upon in that stony region. It belonged by right to the forest, and to the forest it fast returned. From the top of the hill where we had been sitting we had seen prosperity in the dim distance, where the land was good and the sun shone upon fat barns, and where warm-looking houses with three or four chimneys apiece stood high on their solid ridge above the bay. As we drew nearer to Mrs. Martin's, it was sad to see what poor, bushy fields, what thin and empty dwelling places had been left by those who had chosen this disappointing part of the northern country for their home. We crossed the last field and came into a narrow, rain-washed road, and Mrs. Todd looked eager and expectant and said that we were almost at our journey's end. I do hope Miss Martin will ask you into her best room where she keeps all the Queen's pictures. Yes, I think likely she will ask you, but it ain't everybody she deems worthy to visit them, I can tell you, said Mrs. Todd warningly. She's been collecting them and cutting them out of newspapers and magazines time out of mind, and if she heard of anybody sailing for an English port, she'd contrive to get a little money to them and ask to have the last likeness there was. She's most covered her best room wall now. She keeps that room shut up sacred as a meeting house. I won't say, but I have my favorites amongst them, she told me the other day, but they are all beautiful to me as they can be, and she's made some kind of pretty little frames for them all, you know, there's always a new fashion of frames coming round. First it was shell work, and then it was pine cones, and beadwork's had its day, and now she's much concerned with perforated cardboard worked with silk. I tell you that best room's a sight to see, but you mustn't look for anything elegant, continued Mrs. Todd after a moment's reflection. Miss Martin's always been in very poor, struggling circumstances. She had ambition for her children, though they took right after their father and had little for themselves. She won over and above well-married, however kind she may see fit to speak. She's been patient and hard-working all her life, and always high above making mean complaints of other folks. I expect all this business about the Queen has buoyed her over many a shoal place in life. Yes, you might say that Abby'd been a slave, but there ain't any slave but has some freedom. 4. Presently I saw a low gray house standing on a grassy bank close to the road. The door was at the side, facing us, and a tangle of snowberry bushes and cinnamon roses grew to the level of the window sills. On the doorstep stood a bent-shouldered little old woman. There was an air of welcome and of unmistakable dignity about her. She sees us coming, exclaimed Mrs. Todd in an excited whisper. There! I told her I might be over this way again if the weather held good, and if I came I'd bring you. She said right off she'd take great pleasure in having a visit from you. I was surprised she's usually so retiring. Even this reassurance did not quell a faint apprehension on our part. There was something distinctly formal in the occasion, and one felt that consciousness of inadequacy which is never easy for the humblest pride to bear. On the way I had torn my dress in an unexpected encounter with a little thorn bush, and I could now imagine how it felt to be going to court and forgetting one's feathers or her court train. The queen's twin was oblivious of such trifles. She stood waiting with a calm look until we came near enough to take her kind hand. She was a beautiful old woman, with clear eyes and a lovely quietness and genuineness of manner. There was not a trace of anything pretentious about her, or high-flown, as Mrs. Todd would say comprehensively. Beauty in age is rare enough in women who have spent their lives in the hard work of a farmhouse, but autumn-like and withered as this woman may have looked, her features had kept, or rather gained, a great refinement. She led us into her old kitchen and gave us seats, and took one of the little straight-backed chairs herself and sat a short distance away, as if she were giving audience to an ambassador. It seemed as if we should all be standing. You could not help feeling that the habits of her life were more ceremonious, but that for the moment she assumed the simplicities of the occasion. Mrs. Todd was always Mrs. Todd, too great and self-possessed a soul for any occasion to ruffle. I admired her calmness, and presently the slow current of neighborhood talk carried one easily along. We spoke of the weather and the small adventures of the way, and then, as if I were after all not a stranger, our hostess turned almost affectionately to speak to me.
the weather will be growing dark in London now. I expect that you've been in London, dear, she said. Oh, yes, I answered. Only last year. It is a great many years since I was there, along in the forties, said Mrs. Martin. "'Twas the only voyage I ever made. Most of my neighbors have been great travelers. My brother was master of a vessel, and his wife usually sailed with him. But that year she had a young child more frail than the others, and she dreaded the care of it at sea. It happened that my brother got a chance for my husband to go as supercargo, being a good accountant, and came one day to urge him to take it. He was very ill-disposed to the sea, but he had met with losses, and I saw my own opportunity and persuaded them both to let me go too. In those days they didn't object to a woman's being aboard to wash and mend. The voyages were sometimes very long, and that was the way I come to see the Queen. N Mrs. Martin was looking straight in my eyes to see if I showed any genuine interest in the most interesting person in the world. Oh, I am very glad you saw the Queen, I hastened to say. Mrs. Todd has told me that you and she were born the very same day. We were indeed, dear, said Mrs. Martin, and she leaned back comfortably and smiled as she had not smiled before. Mrs. Todd gave a satisfied nod and glance, as if to say that things were going on as well as possible in this anxious moment. Yes, said Mrs. Martin again, drawing her chair a little nearer. It was a very remarkable thing. We were born the same day, and at exactly the same hour, after you allowed for all the difference in time, my father figured it out sea fashion. Her Royal Majesty and I opened our eyes upon this world together. Say what you may, tis a bond between us. Mrs. Todd assented with an air of triumph and untied her hat strings and threw them back over her shoulders with a gallant air. And I married a man by the name of Albert, just the same as she did, and all by chance, for I didn't get the news that she had an Albert too till a fortnight afterward. News was slower coming then than it is now. My first baby was a girl, and I called her Victoria after my mate, but the next one was a boy, and my husband wanted the right to name him, and took his own name and his brother Edward's, and pretty soon I saw in the paper that the little Prince of Wales had been christened just the same. After that I made excuse to wait till I knew what she'd named her children. I didn't want to break the chain, so I had an Alfred, and my darling Alice that I lost long before she lost hers, and there I stopped. If I'd only had a dear daughter to stay at home with me, same's her youngest one, I should have been so thankful. But if only one of us could have a little Beatrice, I'm glad it was the Queen. We've both seen trouble, but she's had the most care. I asked Mrs. Martin if she lived alone all the year, and was told that she did except for a visit now and then from one of her grandchildren, the only one that really likes to come and stay quiet long a grandma. She always says quick as she's through her schoolin' she's going to live with me all the time, but she's very pretty and has taken ways, said Mrs. Martin, looking both proud and wistful, so I can tell nothing at all about it. Yes, I've been alone most of the time since my Albert was taken away, and that's a great many years. He had a long time of failing and sickness first. Mrs. Todd's foot gave an impatient scuff on the floor. And I've always lived right here. I ain't like the Queen's Majesty, for this is the only palace I've got, said the dear old thing, smiling again. I'm glad of it, too. I don't like changing about, and our stations in life are set very different. I don't require what the Queen does, but sometimes I've thought was left to me to do the plain things she don't have time for. I expect she's a beautiful housekeeper. Nobody couldn't have done better in her high place, and she's been as good a mother as she's been a Queen. I guess she has, Abby, agreed Mrs. Todd instantly. How was it you happened to get such a good look at her? I meant to ask you again when I was here to other day. Our ship was laying in the Thames right there above Wapping. We was discharging cargo and under orders to clear as quick as we could for Bordeaux to take on an excellent freight of French goods, explained Mrs. Martin eagerly. I heard that the Queen was going to a great review of her army and would drive out of her Buckingham Palace about ten o'clock in the morning, and I run after Albert, my husband, and Brother Horace, where they was standing together by the hatchway, and told them they must one of them take me. They laughed, I was in such a hurry, and said they couldn't go, and I found they meant it and got sort of impatient when I began to talk, and I was most broken-hearted. T'was all the reason I had for making that hard voyage.' 
Albert couldn't help often reproaching me, for he did so resent the sea, and I'd known how it would be before we sailed. But I'd minded nothing all the way till then, and I just crept back to my cabin and begun to cry. They was disappointed about their ship's cook, and I'd cooked for forecastle and cabin myself all the way over. It was dreadful hard work, especially in rough weather. We'd had headwinds and a six weeks voyage. They'd acted sort of ashamed of me when I pled so to go ashore, and that hurt my feelings most of all. But Albert come below pretty soon. I'd never given way so in my life, and he begun to act frightened, and treated me gentle just as he did when we was going to be married, and when I got over sobbing, he went on deck and saw Horace and talked it over what they could do. They really had their duty to the vessel and couldn't be spared that day. Horace was real good when he understood everything, and he come and told me I'd more than worked my passage and was going to do just as I liked now we was in port. He'd engaged a cook, too, that was coming aboard that morning, and he was going to send the ship's carpenter with me, a nice fellow from up Thomaston Way. He'd gone to put on his ashore clothes as quick as he could. So then I got ready, and we started off in the small boat and rowed up river. I was afraid we were too late, but the tide was setting up very strong, and we landed and left the boat to a keeper, and I run all the way up those great streets and across a park. T'was a great day, with sights of folks everywhere, but it was just as if they was nothing but wax images to me. I kept asking my way and running on, with the carpenter coming after as best he could, and just as I worked to the front of the crowd by the palace, the gates was flung open and out she came, all prancing horses and shining gold, and in a beautiful carriage there she sat. T'was a moment of heaven to me. I saw her plain, and she looked right at me so pleasant and happy, just as if she knew there was something different between us from other folks. There was a moment when the queen's twin could not go on, and neither of her listeners could ask a question. Prince Albert was sitting right beside her in the carriage she continued. Oh, he was a beautiful man. Yes, dear, I saw them both together just as I see you now, and then she was gone out of sight in another minute, and the common crowd was all spread over the place pushing and cheering. It was some kind of holiday, and the carpenter and I got separated, and then I found him again after I didn't think I should, and he was all for making a day of it and going to show me all the sights. He'd been in London before, but I didn't want nothing else, and we went back through the streets down to the waterside and took the boat. I remember I mended an old coat of my Albert's as good as I could, sitting on the quarter deck in the sun all that afternoon, and it was all as if I was living in a lovely dream. I don't know how to explain it, but there hasn't been no friend I've felt so near to me ever since. One could not say much, only listen. Mrs. Todd put in a discerning question now and then, and Mrs. Martin's eyes shone brighter and brighter as she talked. What a lovely gift of imagination and true affection was in this fond old heart. I looked about the plain New England kitchen, with its wood-smoked walls and homely braided rugs on the worn floor, and all its simple furnishings. The loud ticking clock seemed to encourage us to speak. At the other side of the room was an early newspaper portrait of Her Majesty the Queen of Great Britain and Ireland. On a shelf below were some flowers in a little glass dish, as if they were put before a shrine. If I could have had more to read, I should have known most everything about her, said Mrs. Martin wistfully. I've made the most of what I did have, and thought it over and over till it came clear. I sometimes seem to have her all my own, as if we'd lived right together. I've often walked out into the woods alone and told her what my troubles was, and it always seemed as if she told me it was all right, and we must have patience. I've got her beautiful book about the Highlands, to his dear Miss Todd here that found out about her printing it and got a copy for me, and it's been a treasure to my heart just as if it was written right to me. I always read it Sundays now for my Sunday treat. Before that, I used to have to imagine a good deal, but when I come to read her book, I knew what I expected was all true. We do think alike about so many things, said the Queen's twin with affectionate certainty. You see, there is something between us, being born just at the sometime. Tis what they call a birthright. She's had great tasks put upon her being the Queen, and mine has been the humble lot. But she's done the best she could. Nobody can say to the contrary. And there's something between us. She's been the great lesson I've had to live by. She's been everything to me. And when she had her jubilee, 
oh, how my heart was with her. There, t'wouldn't play the part in her life it has in mine, said Mrs. Martin generously, in answer to something one of her listeners had said. Sometimes I think now she's older, she might like to know about us. When I think how few old friends anybody has left at our age, I suppose it may be just the same with her as it is with me. Perhaps she would like to know how we came into life together. But I've had a great advantage in seeing her, and I can always fancy her going on, while she don't know nothing yet about me, except she may feel my love stay in her heart sometimes and not know just where it comes from. And I dream about our being together out in some pretty fields, young as ever we was, and holding hands as we walk along. I'd like to know if she ever has that dream, too. I used to have days when I made believe she did know and was coming to see me, confessed the speaker shyly, with a little flush on her cheeks. And I'd plan what I could have nice for supper, and I wasn't going to let anybody know she was here having a good rest, except I'd wish you, Elmira Todd, or dear Miss Blackett would happen in, for you'd know just how to talk with her. You see, she likes to be up in Scotland, right out in the wild country, better than she does anywhere else. Exactly. I'd really love to take her out to see Mother at Green Island, said Mrs. Todd with a sudden impulse. Oh, yes, I should love to have you, exclaimed Mrs. Martin, and then she began to speak in a lower tone. One day I got thinking so about my dear queen, she said, and living so in my thoughts that I went to work and got all ready for her, just as if she was really coming. I never told this to a living soul before, but I feel you'll understand. I put my best fine sheets and blankets I spun and wove myself on the bed, and I picked some pretty flowers and put them all round the house, and I worked as hard and happy as I could all day, and had as nice a supper ready as I could get, sort of telling myself a story all the time. She was coming, and I was going to see her again, and I kept it up until nightfall, and when I see the dark and it come to me I was all alone, the dream left me, and I sat down on the doorstep and felt all foolish and tired. And if you'll believe it, I heard steps coming, and an old cousin of mine come wandering along, one I was apt to be shy of. She wasn't all there, as folks used to say, but harmless enough and a kind of poor old talking body. And I went right to meet her when I first heard her call, stead of hiding as I sometimes did, and she come in dreadful willin', and we sat down to supper together. T'was a supper I should have had no heart to eat alone. I don't believe she ever had such a splendid time in her life as she did then, I heard her tell all about it afterwards, exclaimed Mrs. Todd compassionately. There, now I hear all this, it seems just as if the queen might have known and couldn't come herself, so she sent that poor old creature that was always in need. Mrs. Martin looked timidly at Mrs. Todd and then at me. To was childish of me to go and get supper, she confessed. I guess you want the first one to do that, said Mrs. Todd. No. I guess you want the first one who's got supper that way, Abby. And then for a moment she could say no more. Mrs. Todd and Mrs. Martin had moved their chairs a little so that they faced each other, and I, at one side, could see them both. No, you never told me of that before, Abby, said Mrs. Todd gently. Don't it show that for folks that have any fancy in them, such beautiful dreams is the real part of life. But to most folks, the common things that happens outside them is all in all. Mrs. Martin did not appear to understand at first, strange to say, when the secret of her heart was put into words. Then a glow of pleasure and comprehension shone upon her face. Why, I believe you're right, Elmira, she said and turned to me. Wouldn't you like to look at my pictures of the Queen? she asked, and we rose and went into the best room. Five. The midday visit seemed very short. September hours are brief to match the shortening days. The great subject was dismissed for a while after our visit to the Queen's pictures, and my companion spoke much of lesser persons until we drank the cup of tea which Mrs. Todd had foreseen. I happily remembered that the Queen herself is said to like a proper cup of tea, and this at once seemed to make Her Majesty kindly join so remote and reverent a company. Mrs. Martin's thin cheeks took on a pretty color like a girl's. Somehow, I always have thought of her when I made it extra good, she said. I've got a real china cup that belonged to my grandmother, and I believe I shall call it hers now. Why don't you? responded Mrs. Todd warmly with a delightful smile. Later they spoke of a promised visit which was to be made in the Indian summer to the landing and Green Island, 
but I observed that Mrs. Todd presented the little parcel of dried herbs, with full directions, for a cure-all in the spring, as if there were no real chance of their meeting again first. As we looked back from the turn of the road, the Queen's twin was still standing on the doorstep watching us away, and Mrs. Todd stopped and stood still for a moment before she waved her hand again. There's one thing certain, dear, she said to me with great discernment. It ain't as if we left her all alone. Then we set out upon our long way home over the hill where we lingered in the afternoon sunshine and through the dark woods across the heron swamp.